OK, welcome to the second lecture. A um, few announcements to begin. Uh, in order to submit the homework on Sunday, you will need a class account. I'm sure you are familiar with these. So there are a few left. Please pick them up at the end of the lecture. Uh, number two, maybe not all of you are on Piazza yet. So if you are not, sign up for Piazza, because you will find announcements such as the starter kit, a starter code for the homework was released. And so please do the sign up. Um, Next thing I need to announce, now I need to remember. Uh, OK, that's right. So if you want to work with a partner for projects, and in fact, you will have to, because the projects are hard enough that you will want to have a partner and will insist that you have one. So if you have a partner already, or you know who that would be, send us email by end of Sunday. And for people who do not have a partner or will not have a partner by Sunday, we will try to use the homeworks and a little questionnaire to match you up according to your skills and schedules. Um, that's probably all there is to it. So the homework, you need to know about that. If you're on Piazza, you do know. Uh, today is Thursday, so no laptops. We'll talk instead to each other and to me, hopefully. And. Uh, that's probably all about administrativia, unless you guys have some questions. The lectures are screencasted. The one on Monday was recorded, probably missing audio for the first six minutes or so. When they posted, I don't know. Do you guys know how long it takes to get this posted? This is the first time I'm trying it. I'm also recording it myself, but this mic doesn't seem to work really well. So uh, we have probably one screencast with good audio and one with good video, and then you can maybe put it together with the slides. Uh, yes? Uh, it gets recorded. The things, so what I write on the screen gets recorded, but things that I only scribble to underline and use as a pointer, I erase. But things that I may, uh, mean to stay are uh, part of the published PDF. OK. So let's start. So two more things. You probably noticed on the calendar that there are two midterms, one of them in the middle of the semester, the other one at the end, where the last lecture would be. And then final exam is actually show and tell with posters and demos. Uh, the grading is roughly like this, of course, quite a bit into the projects. The final project is important too, but you only have three weeks to it. So it will be maybe this phone. Uh, so only 15% for that, considering it's about three weeks. Class participation is important because it's an upper level class. In fact, it's sort of a design class where you should build stuff. We want to think of it to the extent possible as a studio. You build stuff, you show it to people, they come, they give you ideas, they critique it. So the talking is important. And I know not everybody feels comfortable raising your hands in the lecture room. I, I never did as a student. But there are other ways. You can talk in the smaller venue of the recitation section. You can talk on Piazza. You can post your comments to the lecture notes. There are many ways how to express yourself, ask questions, and participate. Uh, so what did we do last time? Last time we looked at about 10 examples, five of them in more detail, of small languages that programmers are actually likely to write in their practice. And you would be among them, perhaps. We talked about what is a programming abstraction. Programming abstraction is. Essentially, you could say a bunch of data types with operations on them, objects with method calls. When you have streams, you would have filters and the data flowing between them, so the streams. And usually a way of, and that's important, putting abstractions together, composing bigger abstractions out of smaller abstractions. So building bigger procedures out of smaller procedures would be this example of using abstractions to get bigger and bigger and bigger software. This is how software is built, because you cannot write one million lines of code completely flat, of course. So what is a language and what is a small language? We also cover to some extent. But let's actually practice it with something that we did not have a chance to cover. So the map reduce story. So who knows what's a map reduce? You probably used it, all of you. So how would you call it? Is it a library, framework, tool, compiler? Actually, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm, I'm curious how you perceive it as, what you perceive it as. 
Higher order functions, okay. So it is some sort of a library with higher order functions, right? You pass it the operation that happens in the map phase, operation that will take place in the reduce phase, and then this big runtime will get the computation crunching on thousands of machines if necessary. So to compare map reduce to the state of the art before, how do you think people implemented these large scale data processing computations on thousands of nodes in a cluster? We can pose the question differently. You can ask, so if MapReduce is so useful, it's presumably because it abstracted a lot of plumbing, nasty, dirty detail away from the state of the art before. So even if you don't know what it was, you probably can venture to guess what tools people used to write such applications before. Uh huh. Exactly. So they use a library like MPI, which is a library for sending messages from one process to another, receiving it, unpacking it, and probably a library for starting processes on all these nodes. And when nodes crashed, it was in the hands of the programmer to recover the nodes, recover the data, and do all of this. So you could say that oops, it all started with a library like MPI for message passing. And this is nothing but a bunch of procedures that you could call. And then came MapReduce, which encapsulated more, abstracted more of the things. And I would call it a framework. Now, there are a million definitions of frameworks on the web, but I have something clean for you. So library is sort of a simple, flat function that you call. Okay. And it returns and it gives you some value, right? Another example of an abstraction package as a library would be a socket. It has a beautiful abstraction, right? It's a complete illusion, in fact, because if you look at the hardware, at the network, there is no such thing as a socket. You send a message across the socket, everybody listening on the Ethernet can listen to the message, but you have the illusion that the message goes from socket on one machine to the socket on the other machine. It's a fantastic abstraction because it completely divine something that doesn't really exist in reality. And therefore, it hides a lot of plumbing. So socket would be such a library. Just call it and returns back the data. Framework would be a library that is high order in the sense that you give it some functions. right? So a framework would be a library that you could say has holes in it. Right? And these holes are plugged in by the user. So in this hole, you would put a function f and G, and these are the functions that would be invoked in the map phase and the reduce phase, therefore it's high order. So you could say that the framework is a parameterizable library. Of course, it comes with the abstractions. Libraries come as well. Sockets are abstractions. But it allows you to hide more and parameterize it, and therefore you can write more stuff because you can sort of plug in the function that the user wants where it where they belong. So now if you think about the limitations of MapReduce, what do you think would come as the next step to make the programming of such clusters easier? Some language where you just write the program normally and the compiler figures out how to distribute it? Well, it could be sort of an optimizing compiler where you write a C program or a scheme program and it compiles it. This is in general quite hard to do well. So uh, it could work in some cases but sort of a sober solution that is guaranteed to work, sort of a small delta that improves on the state of the art of map reduce would be what? Something that does not actually require the compiler to do these heroic acts of uh, distributing it automatically. Uh, so you could lift it up a little bit indeed by sort of making it easier for the user to write the normal program and then tag things. OK, so this needs to go to map. This needs to go to reduce. That's true. But I, from what I know from map reduce programmers, this sort of lifting it up a little bit to shorten the number of lines of map reduce code is not really the burning problem. The burning problem is that map reduce does what? It gives you one pipeline, right? You have one map, one reduce. Real programs require putting maybe three or four such pipelines together in various ways. 
And if you want to do it with MapReduce, you are back to the original MPI problem of taking care of the buffers, runtime management, and again, all these low-level details of buffer management are exposed to you. So MapReduce has an abstraction, but it's really not a true language because these abstractions cannot be arbitrarily composed. You cannot take two MapReduce pipelines, stick them together into a bigger one that has MapReduce, MapReduce, or whatever other composition. And you cannot keep doing this. So that was the big limitations. So this is where languages like Flume, Java, not that well known, but existing. And in fact, this one is developed by Google and used apparently by hundreds of programmers at Google give you the power to lift it to a higher level and compose these pipelines again into bigger ones, bigger ones. So you could now have libraries of MapReduce pipelines. You stick them into bigger ones, put them into libraries, somebody else can use them. So Flume Java is called Java because technically it's a library. Somebody implemented it in Java. It looks like a library. You can download it. But it comes with abstractions like these pipelines. They are stuck together, and they're optimized by a compiler. And the compiler has a reasonable easy job in this case because it's not working with C code or scheme code, but with dedicated abstractions of pipelines, filter, joins, and such. And so optimization is easy because it doesn't take arbitrary program, just those. So you could say Flume Java is composable abstractions. Okay, so you take one MapReduce, you take another. Okay, so this is Map. Reduce, map, reduce, and you can stick them together into something that looks like another pipeline that can be plugged somewhere else. So this Flume Java is what we call here in this class small languages. It's written for only a small, narrow class of programs, but in a company like Google, it takes care of many different problems, makes programmers more productive. And Flume Java is not the only. There is a bunch of things that lift MapReduce to a higher level, like Sozol, defined soon after MapReduce. So we talked about all of this. What are composable abstractions? What are not? So sockets are not because you cannot take a socket and put two of them together to build a bigger, fancier socket. But regexes would be composable because this here is a regex, this here is a regex. And so this whole regular expression here itself is a regex. And you can build them up like this forever. In fact, this one here itself is a regex built out of this and the star. And this one here is, in fact, built as a concatenation of these three strings, each of which is a regex. We'll talk more about the regexes later. OK, so what do we do today? So today we look at sort of the very basic things. What are programs? What are values? What are types? How do you evaluate program? How do you represent them? How do you represent values? How do you represent types? But we'll do it all on a small, fun example that will actually present design challenges and make you think about all these issues. And most importantly, we'll get to the question of how you can actually make your language extensible, right? So often these small languages are written as extensions of big languages. The Flume Java is written sort of as an extension of Java. Java is not quite well suited for writing these small languages, for embedding them into Java, but you sort of can get along with generics. Uh, scheme is better for that purpose. So we want to learn today how to build a small language that actually somebody else who uses the language can grow it, can extend it, without going into the interpreter or compiler and doing hacking. Okay? And what we are going to do is remember the Google Calculator, right? That's a language, after all. It's true language because you can take an expression and another expression and combine it into arbitrarily big expressions so the programs can be arbitrarily large. It doesn't have sort of procedural abstraction, so in a sense it cannot hide things, but I'd say it's a language. Now, we'll do better than this. We'll show you how to implement that, but we want to see what other features we could add to the language, to this calculator language, so that it is even more useful than the Google Calculator. Okay. So this is what the calculator does to refresh your memory. Imagine you want to find out how fast those ferry boats work on the San Francisco Bay. You go to their website, figure out it's 34 knots. I have no clue what that means, but this calculator is translated into miles per hour. And here is the same expression that we have seen. And this is really, of course, the volume, which is this, with energy, and another volume, and power 
and happens to be day expressed, time expressed in days. So what constructs does the language already have? Can we get a quick list of what's available in the language, in this calculator language? So we would say there are numbers. Of what type do you think they are? The numbers. <coughs> Ints, floats, both? Floats, OK. <coughs> there might be ints. We would need to poke a little bit to see. But I don't know. It's not so important. We'll need to decide for our language what we do. So do you think these units are? These are what? These are not by themselves numbers, right, these units. Is, it, is that something you can liken these units to? Yeah, I, it's one legal view that sort of you can add a type, sort of a type, right? Not like a string type or a flow type. But I think it's fair to say that these are types. Definitely, that's how I plan to talk about them. Um, what else is there? So we have numbers and units. Sort of these are the leaves of the expressions. Right, if you see. So then there are operators. So some operators are obvious, right? Are there some operators that are not so obvious and are specific to this example? Some. There would be this converter operator, right? This in, which you could say conversion operator. OK? That's probably it. Is there more? Huh? Per, I see. So I would say, well, OK, good. So what is per? Is it conversion, or is it just, uh, can we somehow clump it with something else? What's that? Division. Division. So I think that per is actually an alias, is an alias for for the division operator. It's, of course, cool to make it so easy to add new operators by just saying, this is the same as that. Per may operate or on types, just like division you can put between meter and seconds. But uh, if you think of numbers and units as sort of the leaf things on which you operate, they are either values or types, uh, the operators, OK, the operators are overloaded to work on one times two, but they can also work on meter times second. So in a sense, the operators work for both. We'll get to it during this lecture. So is there more in this language than that? OK, excellent. So uh, parentheses, OK. And parentheses are interesting because they are in the language kind of and kind of not. Does the interpreter you think really know about parentheses? At some stage, these parentheses evaporate. At some stage of the evaluation of the program. Why is it that we don't need them at some point? OK, OK, I'm looking. Right, more people. Why don't we need those parentheses? How do you think those programs or expressions are represented internally? I imagine they're pre-parsed and then restructured in terms of the order of the operation. OK, that so they are restructured and pre-parsed, and they are structured as what? Uh, as uh, what data structure? A tree would be the natural choice, just like these scheme expressions, right? Scheme doesn't need a parser because it's already parsed for you into these X expressions, OK? Exactly. So these parentheses are there, but only exist on the surface level at where you type it. After that, they are gone. And when they print you the result, they put them back in so that you can understand the precedence of these operators. All right, I think that's it, unless somebody can tell me that we are missing something. Oh, right, OK. So like half and a quarter are synonyms for some constant. So good point, right. 
Uh, but even with these, these are fun to add in, and you'll add them when you build your parser. But this is enough to make it challenging, you, as you will see. Uh, what I want to do now is, how do we extend it? How do we, how do we turn the Google calculator into a Berkeley calculator to make it actually more useful to people? So can you now, actually, this is right. This is where we want to be. Uh, so can you talk to your neighbor for a few minutes and try to come up with scenarios of how we could extend this calculator to make it more useful? I have a few such scenarios in the lecture, and it will drive the development of the language. But I'm curious what you'll come up with. I want some extra scenarios because I would like to show you that maybe we can support fun, useful features by doing very little in the language. OK, so uh, I think you probably have something. So let, let's hear from a few people. Uh, in future lecture, I may consider having a random generator to generate an x coordinate and a y coordinate and pick somebody. But for now, it looks like we could hear uh, from volunteers. OK. So OK, we could add the variables and have essentially a constraint solver, an equation solver. OK, that would, that would probably complicate things quite a bit. Not that this is a bad idea. It would be great, because now all of a sudden, it's not just a matter of evaluation some program. You need to essentially solve equations, right? Uh, these things are not too hard, but all of a sudden, the inside of the interpreter would change quite a bit. So I, I love the idea. Uh, it probably would not be a tiny extension that I can do in three lines of interpreter code. Uh, the idea is good. Uh, OK, so if you didn't hear, more complex numbers, base 2, base 16, OK, complex. Uh, so but let me, let me write this. So essentially, equation solving, which involves variables, of course, whose value you solve. Now we say complex base 2, OK? What is that? Matrices. Matrices. OK. Well, I'll add it here, since these are essentially richer type, right? Just like complex number is two numbers, two floats. Matrix would be a matrix of numbers. <laughs> All right, OK. So that may also require quite a rich library of, of uh, algebraic rules that we can use to perhaps simplify to do integrals, since there isn't a sort of deterministic algorithm. But would be useful. OK, please. OK, 
So that should be easy to add, right? Because this is just one expression. So uh, let's call it a power function. Right, so I'm looking for something that is easy to extend and useful, so a good ratio in that way. Okay. So new unit types, right? And conversion naturally comes with it, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, new operators, so this is power and arbitrary operators. So presumably you would need to give them some general language, right? Well, sometimes you might create new operators out of existing ones, and that probably you would need essentially the ability to define a procedure, use it as an operator. Okay, three more. One? Yes. Okay, so you could say infinite arithmetic, right? Infinite precision, including for rationals. Okay, 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 so time, dealing with time, including the current time, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, reverse Polish notation. So uh, this is essentially, you're saying, new syntax, right? Since that's really all that it changes. Sure, why not? Right? If you grew up with the HP calculator. Okay, one more. It looks integer division. So we do have integer division. I think it just does the usual, that it takes the whole, uh, the floor of the result. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't. You're right. It will convert it into float. So I would put it here. You're right. Uh, int division. So this is great. I put new unit types and time left up because this is what I happens to have prepared in the slides. Okay? And the interesting thing is that I view this as letting the user, not the programmer, the user, I mean your grandma, extend this language with new units. So you want to do it in such a way that they don't need to learn Python and change the interpreter. They can just define a new units. And there is something cool about the time as well. So let's, let's go there, okay? So uh, we could, yes, add variable functions. These are the operators. Uh, but let's see what we'll do. Okay, so how do we grow the language? So now I don't mean growing by the end user. I mean by us. We'll build the language sort of piece by piece. So we'll start with simple arithmetic expressions over numbers. And uh, uh, the language is defined by syntax and by semantics. Syntax will tell you what? How the program looks on the surface, right? What operations you have, how you can compose together. And semantics will tell you what they mean. What does it mean to do multiplications of integers? If I take 5 and 2 and multiply them, what is the result? That's semantics of the language. Okay? So, in this language, what do we have in this sort of subset for arithmetic expressions? We say the program needs to be an expression, which could be either an int, so a number. Let's just have ints. It could be an expression in parentheses, or it is two expressions connected with some operator. And the operator can be, well, plus, minus, times, division, and power. Right? So this is nothing but a grammar that defines the language. We need to use a grammar because these expressions could be arbitrarily large, so we need a grammar to define an infinitely large language, right? Because the grammar recurses to itself, right? This E recursively refers to that, right? So one example from this language would be program 1, program 1 minus 2. It could be also 2 minus 3 divided by 4. These are all examples from this language, okay? Now, the meaning, okay, so the syntax defines that we have these programs. Here, in here, we're assuming we have some floating points, some uh, floating point numbers as well, but that doesn't matter. Now, how do we define what E1 plus E2 means? So given the values of E1 plus E2, 
e1 plus e2 is the sum of these numbers. So you're saying whenever we see a plus operator, we need to take these numbers and add them. Seems trivial, but there are some uh, subtle issues there, right? So we want, when we want to tell somebody, go and implement this language for us, he will come back to us and ask, well, what should plus do? What little details do we have to spell out for the implementer? Okay, so you need to parse the number. So you, in, there are these little things like how is the number represented as a text? Is it binary? Is it decimal? Does it, can it have decimal point? Okay. Once we turn them into some binary representation, then how do we specify what plus means? What other issues are there? How do you, how much decision do you? Exactly. Are these 32 bit numbers? And after that, they throw an exception or overflow to back to zero or back to negative uh, two to the 31 or something. Okay, so all this is important. So these are roughly these questions. Now what we are going to do is say, we are not going to worry about this. We are going to implement this language in Python and we will use Python arithmetic to implement our plus. So whenever we see our plus, we'll just call Python plus. Whenever C our times, we call Python times, okay? Let's see whether this works for us, okay? And uh, the same, right, for float. So there is nothing much to say here. We just made a decision to delegate arithmetic to, to uh, the Python interpreter. So now, how do we represent uh, How little it takes to scare two adults. Uh, so how do we represent the program? So we talked about the fact that these programs will be trees. And so there is nothing much more we need to say, except I'd like to make the distinction between the concrete syntax, which is what you type in, and abstract syntax, which is what the program is represented with internally for the interpreter, right? And so the concrete syntax is 1 plus 2. The abstract syntax would be this tree plus 1 Two. This is the Python notation for what kind of data structure? It's a tuple. In this case, it's a triple, which has a string for plus. We represent operators as strings. It's not beautiful, but uh, doesn't really matter in this case. And then two numbers are the leaves, right? And then this is a somewhat bigger tree, and so on. So the concrete is turned into abstract, and it's abstract because useless stuff that is needed in the text, like parentheses, are abstracted away. So this is so-called abstract syntax tree or AST. This is essentially what we'll be working with for first few weeks. This should be all well known from 61A. OK, so now we are going to build an interpreter. So here is one AST. We built it by hand. We also have a parser that you can download. It will parse it for you uh, from the concrete syntax to this AST. And now we want to call an eval procedure that walks over this tree and prints the result back. Okay? So how do we write the eval? What sort of program structure will you use? We have all written such evaluators in 61A, I bet. Unless that was the week when the weather was really nice and you went to the beach instead. So what is the structure of the interpreter that we'll use? OK, we need more people to this. Hopefully, it's obvious. Well, let's try over there. Yes, please. You do a recursive evaluation. Uh -huh. So you do recursive evaluation. So you presumably walk the tree. Are you propagating the values in order, pre-order, post-order, bottom up, top down? How will that work? Uh -huh, which is bottom up, right? So if we have a we have a star with a plus, and here we have three, four, which is this three here, and then five, we'll push the values bottom up, right? So here we'll push value five, here we'll push value four and three, 
what value will flow here? 7 and then, oops, the result would be 35. Okay? That's it. So bottom up, of course. Not all evaluators work like that, but this is what this particular language needs. So uh, what do we do here? Uh, you get the tree, and so this E, okay, what do we do? What do you think we are checking for in here? Let me show you a few more cases. This is Python, which you may not have seen, but it should be self-readable, self-documented, self-evident, everything. Uh, is what's good and bad about Python. So what does this do? in the recursive scheme, please. Uh -huh. so, so this is the leaf of the recursion, or you could say the base case, right? OK. And so this would be invoked, right, this line for 3 and 4 and 5. This would be this line. So type 1 evaluates to int, because the type of 1 is int. And if the type of E, so this is the E, is int, then we just return the number. If the number is a float number, we don't have one in this program, then it is also returned. OK? So what do you think this case means here? I see you, but I want others to participate as well. So what would be the type with this funny parentheses inside? It's a tuple. So this is essentially says, if this is a tuple, this means we are at some internal node of the tree. OK? And now you are breaking the tuple. You are looking at the first operator, which is here, and see, oh, it's a plus. Uh, you recursively evaluate the left child, the right child, then you take the result, do a plus, you return it. Same for all the other operators, including power. See, so we are turning our operator power here into Python operator double star, because that just happens to be the syntax for power. OK? Is there anything funny here that you see any dangers? OK, so if the input is an empty tuple, so essentially an empty tree, then uh, yes, this will crash with a big fire, right? So there is no error handling here. We are assuming that these trees are nicely well formed. So an excellent point. There is absolutely no error handling. And no interpreter should look like this, but I want to have it nice and small so that we can put it on one slide. OK? It doesn't differentiate between unit and integer because so far we are only assuming integers. So there are no units here so far. OK, please. And division by 0, okay, excellent. So this is another error handling that what, what will happen if I divide by 0? Is the program going to crash with an error message? Or uh, is, is there going to be an error message? Who generates it? Yeah, the Python interpreter will be called here, right? It will perform Python this division with this value and the 0. This will evaluate to 0, right? And an error will be thrown by the underlying Python interpreter, which may not be the right thing. We may want to check for zeros ourselves and throw our own message. If we are writing an interpreter in some strange language, I don't know, Mesopotamian, then you may want to at least translate the Python English message into that language. So. An illustration why your own error checking may be useful. But otherwise, this should be really straightforward unless you have some interest. Let's leave your comments for the more fancy stuff. OK. So we are done with arithmetic expressions. We are going to do physical units. So far, only the standard units, like meters and kilograms, not feet, and so on. All right. 
So we want to do now things like this, 2 meters squared, which evaluates to 4 meters squared. Okay. And what we did so far is absolutely trivial. We just said we now define units. Okay. And we add u among the expressions. So now we can have things like 1 times m. Okay. So did you notice a new funny operator in our grammar? So what is okay, what is the epsilon doing there? So the epsilon, you may not know, is means an empty string. Do you know what construct are we enabling with this? OK, things like, thanks to this, you can write 1m is now legal in this language, OK? Yes. Oh, you're saying that what we want is a matching number of left and right parentheses. Oh, I see. So you're asking what what does it mean when I write say two space three, right? Is this two times three or is it twenty three or is it two three, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So that's a good question. I was hoping to avoid it for now since we'll talk about these issues later. Uh, but usually the programs are compiled in such a way that first you have a lexer, okay, which is or lexical analyzer. And what it will do, it will first look at the input and break it down into sort of chunks of text. So the chunk of text would be 42, space, and 35. And the space would be omitted, actually. So 42, comma 35 would be actually the sequence of lexemes or tokens that is passed down to the evaluator. So this lexical analyzer would be responsible for throwing out spaces and merging when spaces are irrelevant and dividing things where they should be divided. So here the space is important because it breaks 42 and 35 into two things. Now whether the parser which comes later and processes these tokens understands this to be a multiplication, it's a different story, but in our language it should, right? Because if we have 42, 35, they can only be next to each other with this operator between them. And we presumably are defining this to be multiplication. The meaning of 1 times n and, and 1m would be the same, indeed. So remember, this here is concrete syntax, which the parser turns into the more simple abstract syntax. So notice what happened here. Do we have a multiplication here? We don't, right? Yet the parser, so, oh, I see. What you really meant is the epsilon operator. And the parser decided to put the star at the top of the tree because it is really three times m squared. So notice this. So there is really an epsilon here, OK? An empty string, please. According to this concrete syntax, 1 plus m is a legal program. Oh, excellent. I like it. So 1 plus, all right. Don't tell them I paid you $20 to ask the question. OK. so. So, so this is a fantastic opportunity to ask the question. Clearly, according to this grammar, 1 plus m is a legal program. And so is 2 feet minus 3 kilograms. So the question is, uh, presumably, we want to catch these errors and give the programmer an error message or a warning. Where will that error checking happen? In the parser, as we go from the text into the tree, or in the evaluation, as we are walking the tree, Choice C, these two will have to collaborate together to make the error checking possible. And D is, well, we can catch these errors in some cases, but not in general. So who thinks it's A? Don't be shy. You'll have to raise your hand once during these four options. OK, so A. OK. And who thinks uh, B? OK, how about C? 
Okay, and D? Okay, so uh, there are quite a few people who thought either A or C or D. Well, even B is okay. Try to now talk to your neighbor and convince him or her that you are right. Without violence, of course. <laughs> So, okay, so it has quieted down. Some people are not talking, so I think I'll have to write that random number generator uh, to poke at people. So let's take the vote again. So who thinks it's A? Okay, it looks like opinions have not changed that much. B? Okay, there are more Bs now. All right, how about C? Like fewer Cs and D? All right, so you have an example that cannot be caught. This is good, I'd like to hear. B and D, okay. But there are some cases that you'll miss. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So you are really thinking about can we verify prior to running the program that there is no error. Uh, okay, so that might be difficult depending on the language. In our language, we could do it unless we don't know what value the programmer will input. So I see what you are saying. But I think we are now we are working in the domain where we would be happy to just catch those errors during the evaluation time, rather than prior to seeing the data. So not compile time, but we are happy to catch them all at evaluation time. And these errors can be all caught at evaluation time easily. Now, clearly you know how you would do it during the evaluation. Do you propagate the types bottom up, right, together with values? And when there is some mismatch, you are subtracting kilograms from feet, you throw an error. That's exactly how it works. Now, why would it be difficult for the parser to do such a thing? Parser can clearly catch an error here because it will see, oh, this is a number, this is a unit. Clearly, these two should not be added together. It's obvious, right? Right, so if, if we assume that the parser only has this local knowledge, it can see 1 plus m, then yes, this error can be caught. But as soon as you have something like, well, 1 plus m, all of a sudden the type is not local. It's hidden under the parentheses somewhere deeper. And now the parser would need to propagate the type. It can, but now it's all of a sudden doing the job of the evaluator. Right, so it's not that parser cannot do it, but it can do it by playing the role of the evaluator and pushing the top type bottom up. So, uh, so I'd say that this is the right answer. Okay. So, uh, the units are essentially types. We will be propagating now these types during the evaluation because we need to know at each operation what is the type of a particular value. So, how do you think we will represent these types? What would you suggest? So how would we represent this AST, right? This AST, when evaluated, it is one meter squared, right? What data structure would you use to propagate the value? OK, somebody else now. There are many choices. None of them the, the right one. There may be some less optimal than others, but 
more or less anything will do. Maybe a tuple. So what would be stored in this tuple? Okay. Uh, so for this case, what would be in the tuple? Okay, so that definitely will be a tuple, right? We'll have the value, the numeric value, and the unit, the type. Okay, let's call it a unit from now on. Uh, how do we represent the unit? Now here is where we have more choices. Okay. Okay, somebody who didn't speak can make a guess or inform suggestion. Now you need to start predicting what operations we'll have to do on this unit. And now some operations will become better than others, some representations. Uh huh. Two m's meaning m squared. Okay. Uh huh. All right. So what would work? Try to think abstractly. What we are? Are we mapping something to something, or is it the set of some things, the set of pairs? Yeah. Okay. So what about things like? Uh, meter per second, right? We could have values of that type. The result of some computation could be five meters per second. So we need to be able to represent this meter per second thing. So it would be a list of what? Uh, so we would have a list of on the nominator and a list for denominator. That could work. Uh, so I think you are, that's right, because you cannot have a plus. So you are saying it doesn't make sense to have something that represents meter plus kilograms, right? OK, so that's why just nominator and denominator. OK, I think that's very good. That could work. A simplification of this? Uh, exponent, exactly. So now we are getting closer. It would be a set of pairs, unit and exponent, all right? Uh huh. And uh, so, but now we need to understand the semantics a little bit better. If you're saying, well, if it's a set, then I can represent something like m, let's put it as a string, to m1, right? That's a set of pairs. But you would like to say that this unit is illegal. We would like to represent this differently, right? We'd like to represent it as m to the third. You know what I'm saying? That what you are saying is correct, but if we allow any set of such pairs, then I could create such a set. And it's probably not what you want. Gray shirt. OK. So it would be map from, you could say, SI type to exponent, right? So this would now become essentially M mapped to 3. So if I write a program which says M squared times M, it will be normalized into M cube. which is sort of essentially what you said, but canonicalized to the sort of normal form, all right? So it is indeed a map. How do you represent a map in something like Python? It would, could be an array or it, the hash array, exactly, right? This is what we'll do. So my pen misbehaved just a second. Okay. So here, this is essentially a map, m map to second. So here is our tuple. This should be an arrow. Okay, three m to the two. See any problems with that? I think that we actually got it quite nice. And so here is the program. Very little change is needed. Now, 
this eval still takes an AST, so the type of this is AST, and it will return a pair of, say, a number and this unit. And now see how we evaluate. When we do subtraction, the subtraction take one value, which is a number and a unit, and another number and a unit, and it will check, are the units compatible? Are they the same? Right? We cannot subtract meters squared from meters. So here, the normalization to the same representation is actually the right thing. Okay. Oh, OK. So let's hold that thought for a minute, because so far we are only doing uh, SI units. So milliseconds are not allowed. But we'll do it in a second, right? So here, the fact that they are normal allows us to do a really simple test of compatibility. And if they are normal, you just keep the same unit and do the normal subtraction. Multiplication does the subtraction, multiplication on numbers. And you need to write multiply units, right? What does, what does multiply unit do, you think? Right, so this will take, say, m squared times kilogram squared. It will just merge these two hash sets together. Right? If it is m squared times m to the third, it will result in m5, right? This should be relatively straightforward. You can actually click on this and see the code. It takes you to the version of the interpreter, which has just exactly the sublanguage. OK, so now we add non-SI units, so things like milliseconds. OK, so now we want to add feet, year, and in fact, milliseconds here. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, so let's go here. So this would be the right place to. So, look look at this expression here. This one here is three times meter squared, right? And I'm going to evaluate it into a Python data structure that is a tuple of number three, and now this unit here, and the unit does what? It is a hash table that sort of the, the key, so this is the key, OK? The key is the string m. And the value is 2. So this is, sorry, I should have explained this. The Python syntax for an associative array which maps m, the key, to 2. And of course, it could have other exponents. It could have kilograms in it, and so on. Good question, please. OK, so if you, do, uh, well, so what happens if you do meter divided by meter? The result needs to be 1, comma, and then description of a unit that is actually no unit. So how would you represent that? As an empty, right. In fact, it would be a so good, good question. So m divided by m would evaluate into 1 and an empty, empty hash set, which means you essentially have no units associated with it, which is, could be the same as m with exponent 0. But at least in my implementation, I believe such would be flushed from uh, the hash set, just so that it's not printed as m to the 0 at the end. Okay, so like joule for a joule, the unit of energy. We'll get there too. Okay, so non SI units. So we want to do feet and year and milliseconds. And uh, clearly, foot will evaluate to whatever, 0 0.3 meter, because we want to normalize it to that. And uh, how do we do it? It's very simple. At the leaves of the AST, when we evaluate this feet, we evaluate it into 0 0.3 whatever of the SI unit. If we cannot do it automatically, we need to code it into the interpreter because the knowledge needs to come from somewhere. right? So you effectively take these 
non-SI values and we turn them into these SI representations. Well, how, it, how does it happen? Well, look at the interpreter. If it is one, you just return, you return one with no unit. If it's float, again, one with no unit. And now it becomes interesting. If this E is a unit, any unit for that matter, right? So we have encountered a string in the AST. We go into this lookup function. And what's in this lookup function? Can you see what we are doing? The lookup function takes this string, the representation of the unit, uses it as an index into what? Into this hash array. Okay, and if it finds feet, it returns this value, which is 0 0.3 meter to the first. And you can see how you would do a millisecond here, right? You would here have millisecond map to one thousandth of a second. So all these units you need to, of course, insert here yourself, because where else would the system know it? Well, so you are essentially saying, rather than normalizing everything into SI, let's keep it in feed and propagate sort of feed units up to multi. Only normalize if you have Only normal, OK. So, so that's a, actually, that's an excellent uh, comment. So what we are doing right at the leaves of the evaluation, we are turning feed into meters and other such things. And then we do the evaluation in meters. And maybe somebody actually wants to print the result in feed. So we'll do one conversion from feet to meters here, and then on the result, we do conversion from meters to feet back. We could do it. It would mean more complicated evaluator, because it needs to work with non-SI units. And you could do it. I just wanted to have something simple. If the arithmetic is with infinite precision, then we are clearly not losing anything. Okay. So if you can rely on Python using infinite arithmetic, then these two are equivalent, and my solution is probably simpler because inside these operators we are only dealing with SI units. And the conversion to SI at the leaf, so all feed goes to meter, is fantastic because I no longer need to check when do I do, say, addition. Oh, is feed actually a unit of length or not? Because it would be converted to meters, and because it has the same unit as the other operator on the other side of the plus, I know they are compatible and I can do the plus. Otherwise, I would need to have another table somewhere which will tell me feed are actually meters, and therefore they are uh, edible together. OK? So you can see here how we do the evaluation. For example, 3 has no unit. The plus will have this unit. The result has that unit. After multiplication, we have a unit that is 1 plus 1 gets into 2. OK. Now the more fun stuff, OK? So in the interpreter that we have written so far, if we write 1 meter divided by 1 year, the result will be 0 meters per second. That's clearly not what you want. Anybody can venture a guess why this happened? We would like to have a more accurate answer, right? 0, 0.00 something. So why did it happen? Uh, right, because we, are, we put an integer on the input, and the interpreter just delegates it into the integer division in Python. And integer division in Python produces an integer, so it correctly rounded it down to the closest integer. So how would we fix it? Well, we need to have a little bit smarter division. Okay? And uh, what we do when we see something like int divided by int, 
we'd like to keep it as in whenever possible, whenever loss, no loss of accuracy would happen. If producing int would mean that we are losing some accuracy, we need to turn it to a float. So now we see how you may want to build your own arithmetic operators on top of those provided in the underlying implementation language. So again, we keep it as an int whenever this would mean no loss of precision. OK, so again, there is the code there. Now, this is becoming more fun because we are going to handle this operator here. Okay. So the first question is, how do we extend the grammar with this in C, where C is some unit? Okay. So this is our first attempt. I just made E in C part of the expression. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? What is C? Well, C would be whatever can appear. I didn't specify what C is, but let's imagine that C are any units that can appear after in. So you can say in feet, in feet square, in meter divided by seconds. Let's keep that open for now. Uh, so without knowing precisely what we allow for C, is this a good idea what I have done? Try to think where E in C can appear in the resulting program. Please. Exactly. So this is exactly the problem with this, is that the way I have written it, now you can write this expression where, which has in feed inside parentheses. So what does it mean? We are doing a conversion which doesn't make any sense. The in presumably only wants to convert how you print it. So the second attempt is right. It will be a top level operator and it will decide how the value is printed. Okay? So now we have the program is either an expression without in or expression with in. And then the rest as before. OK. Now, what would be valid forms of C? Does it make sense for C to be this? Yeah, no, somebody doesn't like it. OK. Please. So it is true that we cannot subtract meters and seconds, uh, but we already made a choice that the parser cannot catch this. So we could, in principle, allow it here. Uh, the question is whether adding, whether allowing plus and minus in C gives us anything, any power. Would you ever want to say, print something in meters minus feet? Probably doesn't make much sense, right? So the question is, do you want to say two feet in meters minus millimeters? So this is nonsense, right? So and this C would, of course, allow us to do it. So we don't want C to be the same as an arbitrary combination of units. So what do we want to have in C? Which operators make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, so in terms of which units we want to allow, it would be the whole dictionary, right, of SI units and non-SI units, so that's good. How about uh, operators? Looks like we don't want minus or plus because they are meaningless when you are defining the format in which things should be printed. Uh, how about division and times? Makes sense, right? You want to print something in meters per feet, oh, sorry, meters per hour rather than meters per second. So the right value seems to be C would be multiplication. Also, this little epsilon here, division 
And turns out that we want to have a power as well, right? Took me actually a while to get this right. But this seems to be what we want for C. Uh, I think you could. Uh, because the units don't, like U is only a single unit. Right, right, right. So this needs to be, OK, sorry. Uh, I knew there was a bug somewhere here, OK. I think this needs to be all C. And uh, I think this, needs, this is OK, and then a U for base case. Right. I s okay. That's right. Seems to be correct. Maybe not entirely correct. Right. So meter to the meter square meter in parentheses squared. Yeah, you could allow it. I think at that point I went to Google Calculator and see whether they do it, and I said no. Let's keep the exponent simple. Uh, so this is sort of expressive enough for you to express everything you want. Maybe not with all the parentheses operators. Question. And non SI, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, now I don't know what would happen if you print something in meter per feet. It could be that that we want to complain. Oh, you would need a different symbol for pound as a force and pound as, as mass. No, I think you would need to have a different sort of text symbol for the two. So before we close, how do we actually evaluate C? Right now we have an expression that has E in C. So it's a tree that has in on top. It has expression here on the left that we want to evaluate. Right, so we have now in. And now we have expression here, and we have a C here. We know how to evaluate E. And ideally, at this point, I don't want to make any changes to that part of the interpreter, because I debugged it, and I don't want to touch it again. I would like to evaluate C somehow, and then write the case statement in our, my Python interpreter for in. So what should C evaluate to? So that's, that's essentially right. It will be a pair of value and a unit, but both of them are different than before. So syntactically, it, it is again a number and a unit, except this unit here is not converted to SI. It will stay in the original format. So if I say feet times meter times feet, it will stay in feet squared times meter, because that's how I want to print it. So the evaluation is different. Not the normalization, but you just collect them all and collect their exponents, right? You collect it too. The first number, again, is not a value, but it's a sort of conversion between the SI value and this funny value, feet squared times meter. So this is, what, this is the value you use at the end to scale up the result we got from the evaluation of it. You need, no, it's still there. Yeah. I circled it, so it could be there. It would be handled just the same way. Right. So I have a few more extensions to the language, but at this point I want to stop and ask you to fill out a little questionnaire about the courses you are taking and a little bit about background. There are some simple questions that should take you just maybe three minutes to answer, I hope. <laughs> 